began these forums several years ago as an opportunity to help connect the community a little bit more with the state of the health of our harbors. And we had such a great response. We've been continuing them each year since, trying to focus on a new and relevant topic of the day. This year, we're gonna be focusing quite a bit on planning and the future of our harbor health and how the town is looking at doing some planning in the near future along with the current status. In 2009, the town completed their first Nantucket and Matticut Municipal Harbor Plan. And the, the purpose of the plan was really to take a comprehensive look at the island's harbor uses, harbor resources, and essentially make a plan to try and meet the needs for both. This plan fell shortly on the heels of the Massachusetts Estuaries Project Report that had been completed in 2006 by the state, taking a close look at the harbor resources and identifying possible threats to those resources, the health of our waters and the ecosystem, and then looking at some opportunities for the town to move towards restoration and to improve the conditions. So the harbor health has really been a pretty hot topic lately. We've had a lot of discussion in our community uh, in a number of different ways. There's been, uh, recently the community was engaged around town meeting articles to propose fertilizer. We've seen increased in macroalgae instance around the harbors. There's been concern around the scallop population. And it really is a, a pretty good time to step back and take another look at the, the state of the harbor. This coincides with the town's plans to update its harbor plan, which you'll hear about more, but um, typically is updated on a 10-year cycle. So we really want to provide an opportunity for some community involvement and discussion in that process. It's a great time to look at how we've been using the harbor, how things have changed in the last 10 years, and think about some policies and good practices and improvements for the future. So before I get into the nitty gritty and introduce our uh, guest speakers, I just want to thank the Nantucket Yacht Club for having us here. And I also want to thank our sponsors, the Nantucket Shellfish Association, Anderson Stillwater Moorings, and Visco Pumping, and also the Nantucket Land Council's Water Fund, which also supports this event. So as I mentioned, we have the town's uh, Natural Resources Department staff here with us today to take us through the harbor plan, what a harbor plan is, talk a little bit about the history of the 2009 Harbor Plan, the implementation process of the recommendations that resulted from that planning process, and then talk a little bit about what the plan is for our upcoming update and the um, consultants that will be assisting the town with that process. And we really wanna try to engage this audience, all of us here, as well as really provide some motivation to continue to be involved and engaged in the process as it begins and is carried out over the next six to 12 months or so. There's also gonna be a time for the Natural Resources Department staff to provide some updates on water quality and health of our eelgrass and our shell fishing, shell fishery out in the harbors. And definitely we wanna leave plenty of time for questions and answers, concerns, discussion. Because a big purpose and motivation for the Nantucket Land Council of holding this forum is really to provide an opportunity for that engagement to allow the community to interface with the town and get an update in the middle of the summer on what's going on, and also for the town and for us to, to hear from all of you as well um, on your concerns and, and interests. So to start us off, we have Jeff Carlson, who's the director of the Natural Resources Department for the town of Nantucket. That's for you, not for me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming. It's always great to see this many people come out for the state of the harbor. I feel like the first one that we did a number of years ago um, was much lighter attendance, and it's always nice to see new faces every time we're here. Um, sure, I'll happily talk a little closer. I may just take the mic just to, just to hold on to it, because I, I know I pace around a little bit when I talk, so. Uh, 
what we'll have that there. But as like I was saying, it's nice to see everybody. It's nice to have everyone out. Um, before we get into the nitty gritty of the presentation, I would also like to thank the Nantucket Land Council for putting this together. Um, the Nantucket Land Council has always been a really huge ally of the town and has partnered with, um, and really more importantly at times, held our feet to the fire when it needed to be held to the fire to keep progress moving forward in a, a really progressive way. So a big thanks to them for that. And again, thanks to the sponsors that have us in, uh, to the Nantucket Yacht Club for, for allowing us to have such a great venue. So that being said, we're gonna talk a lot about harbor plans today, but I never miss an opportunity to also talk a little bit about some of the other work that the Natural Resources Department is doing. A lot of work that, that goes on, sometimes I feel like is behind the scenes and any opportunity we have to talk to a large group and at least share our message and, and hopefully connect people to the, the story that we're trying to tell um, as we manage our, our environment is, is something that I always like to try to do. So really quickly, our department um, is, is here to preserve, protect, or restore Nantucket's natural resources through responsible active management, research, regulation, enforcement, education, and outreach to the citizens of Nantucket. When I read that, really what I take home is that we need to be an interactive department between the town and the government and the people that are using our resources and participating. It's really paramount that we're creating something that people feel comfortable interacting with and getting outside and enjoying really what makes Nantucket great is we have world-class harbors, fishing, shell fishing, um, hiking, running, bird watching. Nantucket, if you like to go outside, is the place to be. And we want to make sure it's as nice as we can. So the departments within our department are little divisions that we have. Uh, we really focus on shellfish management. Um, I know we'll talk a little bit more about our populations of these uh, scallops and things later. But our program is really unique. We're a place that has a municipal shellfish hatchery. There are no other municipal shellfish hatcheries that function to the level that ours do. Anywhere in the Commonwealth or really anywhere else that I've looked. is It's been a wonderful opportunity to be able to bring the Brant Point shellfish hatchery into, into its own um, and let Tara and her crew work the magic that they do. We also do the shell recycling program. I know the Nantucket Yacht Club here is a participator um, where we collect all the shell and try to get it beneficially reused back to areas in the harbor. Um, I wish Leah was here because she would correct me, but I know we've collected well over, um, I think we're probably over about 80,000 pounds. Yeah, about 50,000 pounds of shell a year that these guys collect. Um, if you see Josh or Sky out collecting shell this year, say thank you, because it is a awful job. <laughs> we also do the beaches of protected species, so those terrible fences and spots where we tell you you can't go for piping plovers and turns. Some of those are our responsibilities. But this is a program we've also started to get into active monitoring for things like erosion, uh, vegetation on dunes, vegetative quality and really kind of merging that with our resiliency program to really get a snapshot of our beach, our beach health and our beach resources as well. Um, our other popular end, the Conservation Commission, I'm sure a lot of you uh, have made applications or been a part of or read the newspaper. Um, they're a popular group at times and not so popular group at times, um, but they do their very best in, in administering the Wetlands Protection Act um, and we thank all seven of them there is one of them here right now. If you see him, you can say thank you too, but I won't point him out so nothing gets thrown at him either. So, <clears throat> Our water quality program, Thais will talk about in detail a little bit later, uh, but that's for our four major great ponds and harbors and streams and some of the other inputs that we have. And new to us in the last really two to three years is the Coast Resiliency Program. The town recently completed a Hopefully I'm not talking into the speaker, but uh, a coast resiliency plan that we've been working with the consultant Arcadis and release that to the public. Uh, and it's a plan that hopefully will give us the roadmap for how we're gonna navigate the challenges of sea level rise and climate change and how we're going to adapt and protect and manage our neighborhoods and important town resources that are threatened by those, you know, those threats that we, we haven't had to encounter before. Um, that's a very interactive process. There is a committee that goes with that. We definitely encourage people who are interested in this to participate, share your thoughts, share your experiences. That's a, a committee and an initiative that is going to be for forever. 
you know, we'll always be trying to deal with these things and we're better as a community than we are just trying to do it as a small group. So um, we hope people can participate in that because we're, we're all impacted by it. But really now to the meat and potatoes of, of what I came to talk about today is the Harbor Plan update for 2022. So municipal Harbor Plans are something that's a state approved plan. We file them with the Department of Energy and Environmental Affairs. And hopefully after some review and some community outreach process, uh, we get to a plan that we submit to the state for approval. So for this Harbor Plan update, we're going to be working with the Urban Harbors Institute of UMass Boston. They're the group that also completed the 2009 plan for us and also our shellfish management plan. And we're also working with the Woods Hole Group who is their subcontractor to do all of their technical information and engineering uh, that goes with the plan. So to kick us off, and so you don't have to listen to me for the entire time, um, on our next slide you'll see Kimberly Starbuck of the Urban Harbors Institute as our consultant. She wanted to send a message. They couldn't unfortunately be here today. Uh, they're hosting a rather large conference up in the Boston area uh, for the next two weeks. But she did send a message, so I'm just going to play a, hopefully a short like five to six minute video where she's gonna talk a little bit about harbor plants. Hi everyone, my name is Kim Starbuck. I am a senior research associate at the Urban Harbors Institute at UMass Boston. And I'm going to be working with my colleagues on the update to the Nantucket and Madigate Harbors Action Plan. We're really sorry we can't be there in person today. Uh, we are hosting a large conference in Boston, but we are looking forward to starting work on this. And we did work on the previous 2009 plan and are excited to work with Woods Hole Group on this new update. So just a little bit of a background on the planning process and to answer some questions that we've gotten so far. Uh, the purpose of the plan update is to create a state approved plan that presents the community's goals, objectives, and recommendations for guiding the use of the land and water of the harbor areas. The plan will also establish an implementation program to make sure that we are carrying out the action items that are going to be identified in this plan. So the plan is going to look at a number of topics that are identified as being important to Nantucket. Some of the topics included in the 2009 plan were natural resources, water quality, commercial and recreational fishing, public access, docks, wharves, and piers, commercial waterfront, harbor operations and safety, and oil spill response. So the 2009 plan had a lot of recommendations on how to improve conditions in Nantucket's harbors, and many of those recommendations were achieved, including the development of a shellfish management plan. So nice job to you all. You really accomplished a lot since the last plan. And the recommendations from the last plan update, they focused on a lot of um, items, including protecting and restoring natural resources, improving water quality, improving the commercial and recreational fisheries of the island, enhancing public access to the harbors, supporting the commercial waterfront, and promoting boating safety. So um, really a lot in there. And this plan that's, um, this new plan is going to include resiliency, which is something that wasn't focused on as much in the previous plan. So that will be new. In terms of the plans process, uh, first we're going to review the 2009 plan, even though we did work on it back in the day, um, good for us to review it and determine the status of a number of the recommendations from the 2009 plan. So, so which recommendations have been implemented? Which ones haven't been? Um, are there any barriers to implement them? And uh, some of them just might no longer be relevant. We're also going to review town studies and any other relevant documents. So um, a lot has happened since the 2009 plan. I know you guys have had a lot of um, studies that have happened on the island. So we're gonna review all of that to make sure we're up to date with what's been done and start to think about what this plan should consist of and also look at any gaps in those studies that have been conducted over the last 10 plus years. There will be a large emphasis on stakeholder and public engagement for the plan, which is really critical to its success. So we're looking forward to engaging all of you. 
Uh, we'll meet with focus groups. Um, those focus groups could consist of fishermen, boaters, other stakeholders to gather information that are really specific to their interests. We also are gonna meet with town agencies and um, other officials to start collecting details on their interests and concerns. We also are going to um, make sure we're really involving the public and then other stakeholders in a lot of different ways, but also in um, public meetings. So those public meetings, we're hoping um, they'll be mostly in person with um, some remote options. Um, we're looking at probably three public meetings and we're also going to develop an online and a paper survey to collect any additional information and allow those people that couldn't attend a meeting to participate. So really what we're saying here is there's no shortage of ways for you all to participate in this process and ensure that your voice is heard. Uh, this really is your plan and we want it to reflect your interests and concerns. So we're going to be starting work on this and working with the town to develop the Harbor Planning Committee we expect public meetings will begin in the late summer and fall, and we think the entire planning process will take approximately one year. In the meantime, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, Kim Starbuck, and my email address is kimberly.starbuck at umb.edu. And you can reach out with any questions, comments, um, and we are looking forward to getting this started and hearing from you. Thanks so much. All right, I'll, I'll give everyone a minute if someone wanted to write down her email address before I change the slide. Repeat, her email address is kimberly.starbuck at umb.edu. If you need it, you can feel free to contact our office and we're happy to connect you as well. So Kim did a nice job talking about what the update process is going to be and we talk a lot about municipal harbor plans and municipal harbor action plans. But re what really is it? It's a plan that a local community can put together that's adopted by the state that really helps to inform the state on what uses the community wants to see in and around its harbors to meet national policy, to be in conformance with other state policy. Um, and really the important one at the end is to foster the right of the people to essentially enjoy the natural beauty and uses of our harbor. Um, just a quick question I have for the group before I dig into the weeds on this, I'll, I'll add a little bit more. Who in this room is at least heard of or slightly familiar with chapter 91? All right, that's a, a handful of people. So I'll just do the 32nd chapter 91. The chapter 91 regulations through Mass General Law is the Public Waterfront Act. It is something that is a direct uh, kind of descendant of uh, the public use doctrine, and that's the regulations that allow for um, the use of tide lands or the area between mean, mean high water and mean low water for fishing, fouling, navigating. Some people like to add strolling. Some people don't think it's valid. We won't get into that debate. But it's really what is a regulation that's in place to keep the public connected to our water and to keep everyone with fair and, and at least access down to those resources so we can all enjoy the water and the public waters of the Commonwealth. So why is this important, these plans in Chapter 91? Well, would we develop a municipal harbor plan the community can identify uses that when they go to put the use component into those chapter 91 licenses or other state-driven regulatory processes involving Nantucket, they reference directly the harbor plan to see exactly what Nantucket wants. Whether we want improved public access, whether we want a better ability to improve our oil spill response, um, whether we want just to improve water quality. Those are the things that they're looking at. So when they issue those licenses and add those use components, people know what Nantucket wants, not what Boston wants Nantucket to have. And I think that's really what the important part of these harbor plans are, is it gives us the control of our water. And I think that's there. And it's important for all the reasons that we like Nantucket, right? It's important because we like to sail and boat. 
Um, and you can go scalloping with Carl Sherland. He'll take you out. He's posed for our picture here for us. So it was nice to see. But those are the real things that make Nantucket the way it is. So where does this apply on Nantucket? The harbor is a, a big area. You know, we talk a lot about the harbor watershed, which gets pretty far inland for both Mattacate and Nantucket Harbor. But really, where are we talking about for the harbor plan? So for Nantucket Harbor, as you can kind of see around the line here, this red line is kind of our boundary that we've historically used for the harbor's action plan process. This is the area that's kind of directly adjacent to the harbor, uh, whether it's parcels or roads, uh, to get in there for Nantucket Harbor. Mattacate Harbors is a little funkier. It's a little bit of a, a, a different place. Mattacate Harbors extends out and includes all of Tuckernock and Muskegon as well. So it's a little different area when we look at those planning. So when we're going through the uses and um, some of the activities that we're trying to permit underneath those things, those are the areas that we're historically talking about. What the plan update provides us to also be able to do is to include or refine the planning area once again. We may be able to make it slightly larger, may be able to make it smaller, but I think as we really look at some of the other information we've gathered in the interim, whether it's better information on how storm water moves and our storm tide pathways, how we see coastal flooding in the areas directly impacted by coastal flooding, we can put all of that together to say our harbor area really isn't just the area directly adjacent to the harbor. It's maybe these areas that are adjacent as well. And as we look at creating goals for those areas, including those near areas, to make sure that those areas are in congruence with, with our harbor uses. So the 2009 plan, uh, I know Emily said it was the first one, almost the first one. It was the first one that I, I think was as complete as it was. Nantucket was one of the first that we did in 1993. So. Um, I was a long time ago. I was in high school then, so I really wasn't involved in the process. Uh, but it was there. And then we had this kind of interesting interim plan in 2007 that bridged us to the 2009 plan, um, where we kind of did a little mini update of the 93 and into 2007. Uh, for all of these plans, and most recently the 2009 plan, there was a really nice committee that was chaired by Dr. Sarah Oktai. Um, who is one of the at-large members, but it's made up of someone from the Nantucket Planning and Economic Development Commission, SHAB, the Marine Trades Association, the Conservation Commission, at the time the Marine and Coastal Resources Department, and then two at-large. So when we're reconstituting for the current update, we'll probably be putting together a, a similar style committee. Given the number of uses and things that are there, I know we've talked with Urban Harbors about maybe a slightly larger committee to get a little bit more community involvement but that committee always meets in public meetings uh, and to be sure that they get as much public input as possible. So now we're to the 2009 plan. And I'll, I'll run through this list really quickly because it's important because I'm going to turn the program over to you guys in a minute. Um, and we're going to do a little exercise here. So in 2009, we developed these action item categories, things like natural resources protection, water quality, commercial and recreational fishing, public access, oil spill response, tourism and recreation, with a bunch of sub-goals that came through those categories. And as the implementation committee rolled forward, those were the categories that we were working in. So to kick off our process today, hopefully everyone when they sat down found a lot of really great information. Hopefully they found a, a program, uh, a copy of the Nantucket Blue Pages, which was a, a goal of the Harbor Plan originally. Um, that Peter Brace, who is here, I saw him, Peter put together and put a lot of hard work to get that out for everybody. Um, so thanks to Peter for, for, for all of his hard work. But really, the other thing that was there, there was a small four by six index card. And I apologize for not having enough pens for people. But this card is kind of our start to our harbor planning process. So we're going to kind of do this as a little bit of a break here. I'm going to force everyone into it like a school teacher. Um, and on this card, Really, the, the front of it where it starts with what is your favorite harbor activity, these categories are the ones that we listed. We're hoping that people will say on the second questions, which one of those categories do you feel like the town has done a really good job with? Which one of these categories do you feel like we could have done a better job with? What do we think needs to be in there? And then on the back side, there's room for other comments, um, things we'd like to see in the new update. If you're interested in participating, there's a spot for you to add your email. We're hopefully asking everyone, and there are hopefully pens for people to share. If, if many of you could fill that out, it would be greatly appreciated and get back. 
Um, and then right towards the end of the program, they don't know this yet, but Josh and Sky will come around and pick them up. Um, that's what they get for sitting in the front, our current interns. Um, we'll come grab those from the middle of the row, so if you could just pass them down and set them on the floor, they'll come grab those. Um, and that feedback will be really useful for us, and we'd really greatly appreciate um, any feedback that you guys can give. So I'm happy to, to leave this list up for a minute if people feel pretty comfortable. Yes, Burton. Yes, Emily is gonna grab my extras from the bag and someone will pop into the back and get those to you guys. Um, and we'll try to get as many of them filled out. I wasn't sure how many people were gonna be here, so I brought 200, so it'd be really great to get a lot of those back. So in 2009, there were some real major highlights that went on, at least from a natural resources perspective. Um, kind of our, our big moment of joy was we were able to put together um, a couple years after the Harbor Plan update went into effect, the first ever in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shellfish management plan. And it's something that I know a, a number of people in this room worked on and completed in that process, but it's something that has really guided our mission at the Brand Point Shellfish Hatchery and SHAB and, and other things as we've moved through, uh, how we're managing our shellfish populations. And that's hopefully something that, as an action item from this plan, hopefully will be to update that again. Um, other things, we have the island perimeter restriction, which is just a fancy way to say that's our zoning restriction on the construction of private docks and piers. And while that's not always popular with everybody, um, it's really put a focus on creating public facilities for people to access the water for docks and piers and to keep our shoreline as unobstructed as possible for people to maintain that access. And then the other big ticket item that we had was the Harbor Overlay Zoning District which is a very targeted zoning on uses and what can happen. And you can kind of see it in the picture there, it's that little purple area, so it's pretty small, uh, but it is very focused and has provided a lot of benefit to the town. So enough with the old plan. I know, <clears throat> excuse me, Kim talked a little bit about what we wanted to do, but as we were putting together kind of the scope of services for the update and kind of worked on it internally and, and spoke with a few groups, we really felt that the 2009 plan did a really good job of identifying the needs of the public and what we wanted to do. So we didn't want to reinvent the wheel too much and just wanted to update that and enhance those again and kind of refresh. But the area I've highlighted in yellow is something that we really want to make sure that we add in because in 2009, we weren't really talking about things like coastal resiliency and sea level rise and how the world was changing around us, is identifying that and putting that into our harbor plan and finding a way to integrate our coastal resiliency planning into our harbor planning so we can avoid the nasty habit that we all have of, we have 30 plans and this plan doesn't match with this plan that doesn't match with this plan that doesn't match with this plan, that they all work together and in concert to have a clear vision on what the town wants to do and what its citizens want to do um, and to add those in. So that's what we're hoping to add in the 2022 plan. So I told Emily I would stick as close as I could to 20 minutes, I'm pretty close. Um, we'll take questions at the end, but um, thank you for your time and, and indulging me in the, the Harbor plan. Again, closer to the end, we'll have Josh and Sky come around and pick up those cards. So if you could just pass them to the middle when you're done, it'll make their job a little bit easier. And with that, I'll either turn it back to Emily or do you want me to hand it right to Thais? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks for that background. Again, I think that it's the early stages of this process for the community for this update, uh, but we're really hoping that today is a, a good first step to engage as many people as possible in this uh, discussion and dialogue moving forward. I think there's probably a lot of thoughts and ideas out there as far as priorities for the town, uh, new recommendations and implementation actions. So we hope to hear a lot of those from the community. So next I wanted to provide an opportunity for the um, some other natural resources department staff to provide an update on the current state of the harbor. The harbor health from a water quality perspective, 
and then also from an ecosystem perspective. So to start with, I'd love to introduce Thais Fournier, who's the water resource specialist, who will talk to us a bit about the current water quality status in Nantucket Harbor. How is my voice if I keep it here? Can everyone hear? Not really. All right. <laughs> I know. Makes me feel like a, a pop singer holding this like this. But anyway, we'll go with this. But good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thais. Uh, I work for the Natural Resources Department, and I'm the Water Resource Specialist. Um, as the theme surrounding the State of the Harbor tonight uh, talks about a sustainable future, uh, and water quality is a huge component of that, and how we can uh, maintain and sustain high water quality. Um, so although we are currently monitoring and testing, and we have been since the 80s, and there are uh, many organizations on island, including the Land Council, who are a big proponent of uh, water quality, uh, we are working together on projects to maintain and invigorate parts of our harbor ecosystem, as many habitats depend on each other to survive. So it's no surprise, obviously, on this beautiful island, we have an increase of uh, coastal development and an increase of population, and even now more so, uh, a larger year-round community. And with an increase of population comes an increase of pollutant loads into our water bodies, uh, specifically Nantucket Harbor. Although um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, we have a, a huge population that's happening, and an issue that we're having with our water bodies is eutrophication, uh, which is an, an excess of nutrients that are coming into our water bodies. So Nantucket is not an exception. Nantucket Harbor does uh, exhibit good water quality. However, there are some stations in our harbor, which I'll talk about, um, that are exceeding its uh, nitrogen levels, uh, which is what we put as um, kind of a threshold to have good water quality. So nitrogen is what, is what we focus on. And this comes from a lot of uh, inputs, such as fertilizer inputs, runoff from our roads, coastal development, septic systems, et cetera, uh, even pet waste. Um, everything contains uh, nutrients that end up into our harbor, because whatever you put on the land ultimately uh, will enter. So as nitrogen is a primary uh, cause of impairment for Nantucket Harbor, uh, it's important that we uh, begin to protect our water quality now and actually in the past, because once it starts to degrade, it's really expensive to reverse and very difficult. Uh, these are two pictures that I've included here from Nantucket Harbor, which is our eelgrass. Uh, Tara will talk a little bit more about uh, our eelgrass um, restoration project with the Land Council. However, we have seen a decline of about 30% since 1995. What you're looking at in these photographs here is algae uh, called lingbia, or some people refer to it as a black algae that has plagued our eelgrass beds. So this is a type of algae that tends to bloom because it's a plant. And so with an excess of nutrients into our harbor, you're going to see more and more of this algae. And what this does is blanket our eelgrass. And as many as you know, uh, eelgrass is a, a huge habitat for a lot of aquatic organisms, including our beloved Nantucket Bay scallop. And so this will block out light to the eelgrass, which will cause it to die. Um, so this is a, a really important um, project that we're doing to restore our eelgrass, but it also starts with maintaining our water quality and making sure that we're not putting nutrients and contaminants and, and others that are detriment to our harbor water. So I wanted to talk about like the current status of the water quality. This is based on 2021 data as we're obviously still currently in our, our sampling season for this year. And our total maximum daily load, which you see, our TMDL, uh, that is the number, the threshold that I was talking about. We focus on nitrogen um, because that is typically um, the focus point that we have that's going to indicate whether 
whether our water body is um, at a, a good level. So if it's meeting this number that you see here, it's a threshold to uh, have good water quality. However, I do say that although over the past 10 years we have seen a downward decline of nitrogen, which is great, we still have issues with our harbor water. So as you can see from the eelgrass photos, our eelgrass decline um, and algal blooms, and you know, the, this focus on the harbor, but we do have an algal problem with our great ponds as well. For those of you who live near ponds, I'm sure you can see um, some of the water just visually even looks um, very green. So even though it is approaching the goal for the nitrogen levels, there's still a lot of room for improvement and what we can all do to improve our water quality. And I will discuss some of the um, things that we all can do as citizens of Nantucket, as visitors of Nantucket, to preserve what we have. Because obviously we're an island, we're surrounded by water. And I'm a little bit biased, but I feel like water is what makes Nantucket, including the people. But I feel like it's a big uh, component of why a lot of people come. It's just our natural beauty and our beautiful waters. So these are the stations that I do sample for Nantucket Harbor. We do sample from June until September, and we sample once a month. Uh, we do this in the summertime because we want to catch the worst water quality um, of the year. So we want a picture of, of how bad the water quality can be. And usually in the summertime with higher populations, uh, we have longer periods of sunlight, um, it's in higher temperatures. Usually our water quality is not what you would see, obviously, in the wintertime. So we focus on capturing um, during the summer months of our water quality. These are the, the areas I wanted to cir uh, circle here in red that are indicating the, um, the sites that are exceeding our nitrogen levels. So these are, um, could be indicative from flow up in the head of the harbor also in the West Pulpus Harbor, which is further down, uh, we have a lot of stream inputs, which are right coming off from Pulpus Road area. So a lot of runoff is also bringing in contaminants, pollutants, nutrients, everything uh, into our harbor system. So I wanted just to give you a visual. So some of the water quality projects that we are actively doing um, include a uh, harmful algal bloom monitoring program. This does focus on the ponds, although uh, we obviously are out on the water, and so if we see something that is concerning regarding algae, because that obviously impacts our, our shellfish, which people are eating on island, um, that is something that we focus on. The town does partner with seven other organizations to do monitoring for our uh, other water bodies on the island. We have about 15 ponds that we monitor. I also wanted to discuss the flow cam that was a recent donation from the Great Harbor Yacht Club Foundation. Uh, and this is a, a cytometer, which basically counts uh, and measures cells. And this is important for um, saving us a lot of time actually under the microscope and taking water samples to notify what types of algae are producing toxins and what are safe for people. Um, as well as the hatchery, because we do a lot of larval counts, and Tara can explain a little more into this, but a lot of larval counts for how much is being spawned into the harbor, which take a lot of man hours when you're doing it manually. And this flow camera is a, a really great tool that we can just pop in, and it, we have a computer system to count, measure, and classify what we're seeing. So we're really excited to begin using that uh, this summer. That was a recent donation. We also have the water quality analysis and visualization tool that's pictured uh, right below. And uh, I feel like this is an underutilized tool. This is, most people ask me about water quality data and if they could see graphs. And the reason why we created this program was for citizens to actually take measures into their own hands and go online and be able to get the data immediately, not waiting for the turnaround time, graph their data if they want online. Um, I don't have the website provided up here, but it is on our Town of Nantucket website under the water quality section. And it's really great. You can click on any point of our sampling stations. Um, and this includes for the whole entire island. So if you're interested in the pond that you live on, 
you can get data uh, from using this tool. We are also, like I said earlier, uh, partnered with the uh, Nantucket Land Council for some eelgrass restoration pilot projects. Emily will discuss more on that as well as Tara. So I won't steal the thunder now. Um, and I also wanted to note on the other picture, we did complete a water resource management plan draft in 2021, which is a nice foundation for a lot of like the history uh, that we have from, you know, the town has many plans and they do surround they do have a water quality component, and this one does compile all this information with future management suggestions. Uh, as Jeff explained, uh, the in-depth the Harbor Action Plan, I, I won't <laughs> go into that, uh, and we're currently in the process of illicit uh, discharge regulations. So this is the two slides, actually, this one and the next one that I really wanted to focus on because it's what you can do to help. So many individuals ask me, you know, uh, you know, they wish the town could do more, you know, what can they do? And a lot of people feel helpless and they think it's just one person. But if we're all collectively doing these actions and we're all collectively improving uh, our water quality and mitigating the nutrients that are entering into our harbor. Uh, so some of the suggestions uh, is maintain your septic systems. Uh, and if you can, if it's possible, connect to sewer. Uh, septic systems about like 15 to 20% uh, reduce nitrogen. I think the number is even smaller than that, so they don't do a really good job in keeping nitrogen out of our harbor. Uh, also, fertilizer, choosing a land, uh, licensed landscaper uh, that has gone through the town fertilizer program, using native vegetation, rain gardens. These are all great buffer systems around your property as when it rains, it's a nice filtration system that will uptake nutrients before it eventually ends up into our harbors. Um, also, we have free pump out facilities. Uh, I think people are using them, but just a reminder. And to protect our eelgrass as well is kind of heating the harbor speeds and slowing down in areas or not anchoring in areas of eelgrass because that obviously disturbs what we're trying to restore. So one of the last ones is to use um, more natural-based products. EPA has great products that you can see on the labels. They sell them at Stop and Shop or any other store that say safer choice. They have been vetted by the EPA. I can personally attest to this because my previous position worked for the EPA and I know how stringent their standards are um, when they're putting this label on products. Um, and again, just, just being cognizant of what you're putting down into your drains or your toilet or your shower systems or sinks. Using a car wash, for example. A lot of people don't uh, realize that a car wash actually has a collection system that is treated versus doing it in your driveway. It's actually worse to wash your car in your driveway. So I know it's annoying to wait in line because there's sometimes a longer line, but you're helping improve uh, water quality that way. Uh, and the last couple of ones is, is please pick up pet waste. I see, although we have a leash law, and I totally understand letting your animals roam free, uh, you can't really see where they're using the bathroom and a lot of pet waste is left uh, in our environment and it's very high in bacteria and it's high in nutrients. Um, or I see it sometimes a lot, people will bag their pet waste but then leave the plastic bagged waste on the beach. So it's, I like to stress just picking that up and disposing does, does make a huge difference. Um, and not feeding our wildlife. A lot of people enjoy that as a pastime, but that actually pollutes our water quality and uh, is not sufficient nutrition for wildlife. So again, I have been guilty of that in the past, um, but if you do not feed the wildlife, and as well as limiting your vehicle use if you can. We have a bus system here. It's a very walkable island. All of these help things help carbon dioxide emissions and uh, any kind of leakages from your cars that are entering into the harbor. So they're, they're simple things, but collectively as a whole, uh, we can all do our part to make a difference. So with that, thank you. We'll be available for questions after, and I'll hand it back to Emily. Thank you, Thais. Definitely appreciate the water quality update. I think that that's a perfect segue talking about the status of the water quality, which I think we'll have some more time to discuss and ask some questions about. 
um, a little bit later on, but to segue to Tara Riley, who's the town shellfish biologist, to talk a little bit more about the status of our shellfish population and eelgrass habitat. Thanks, Tara. Thank you, everyone. The uh, disadvantage of going last is people are starting to glaze over, so I'm gonna try and keep this exciting and also short. Um, all right, so I am going to talk briefly first about the shellfish management plan because it's a very important plan because it has driven everything that we are doing today. And it's used as a guide for us to um, determine which projects we're gonna do and how we're gonna fund them. So a quick history of the shellfish management plan, or we actually call it the SMP for short. Um, it was started in the fall of 2010, and that's when I first arrived on the island. Um, it was completed in 2012, and it also um, was adopted by the select board in 2013. Uh, the management plan was produced in support uh, from the Nantucket Shellfish Association, uh, the Nancy Sales Day Foundation, the Environmental Defense Fund, Nantucket Land Council, and the town of Nantucket, um, and also Urban Harbors that is slated to do our harbor plan also um, helps do the shellfish management plan. Um, as Jeff said, it was one of the first shellfish management plans in the, uh, oops, in the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And really what it is, it's a comprehensive look at the culture, traditions, practices, and the fishery. Um, it's 188 glorious pages. And I have to say, it's not a snoozer. It's really good. You guys should read it. Um, if you haven't checked it out, it's available online. Um, it's really interesting to know what people did in the past um, and kind of what our plans were back in 2012. Um, I'm happy to say that at least 75% of the action items in that plan have been completed. Um, the reason why I'm talking about it, as Jeff said, is that we're hoping with the Harbor Plan update that an action item to include the shellfish management plan update will be included as a high priority. Um, so, Sorry, let me scroll on down here. Yeah, so our department has been using the SMP, um, specifically the matrix uh, of action items to guide our decisions and prioritize funding. All right, so moving on. Um, I wanted to go over a few of the highlights that came out of that plan to show you that plans do work um, and Basically, what we do is we just tackle the list with high priority items. Um, the Brant Point shellfish hatchery renovation that occurred in 2015 and 2016, we were able to secure almost $3 million in funding um, through the town, the community preservation grant, other organizations to design, permit, and renovate our seasonal hatchery into a state-of-the-art, state fully integrated year-round municipal hatchery. Um, to help with all our harbor initiatives. Uh, one of the other programs that came out of it of high priority um, was developed by Leah Hill, our assistant biologist. Um, she created the shell recycling program on Nantucket um, and recycles around 50,000 pounds of shell per year. I think last year was one of the highest years. Um, it was 80,000 maybe um, pounds. Uh, to use for oyster restoration and our future coastal resilience projects. Um, she planned, permitted, and deployed Nantucket's very first oyster reef um, in the Shimo Bend area. And also, as far as management implementation, through the SMP and our departmental strategic plan, uh, we were able to grow from a department of two uh, for the natural resources to a department of nine um, with five interns um, that are seasonal. So we were also able to create a water specialist position, um, which Thais holds, uh, she just talked to you, um, and having a dedicated staff member who is in the field daily 
um, collecting samples, analyzing data, reporting data, and communicating that to our community. Um, it's been a key driver to many of our management decisions when it comes to restoration of habitat or shellfish. Uh, there were many high priority completions to this list. Um, too many to list, but the development of the uh, fertilizer best management practices, Peter Brace's publication of the blue pages, and also um, NSA's work on branding the Nantucket Bay Scallop uh, need to be mentioned as well. All right, so let's shift over to our, our eelgrass update. Um, on this slide, the purplish gray area represents the eelgrass in 2020. And if you combine the, the gray with the green, that represents 1995. Um, and as Thais stated, we've lost 30% since 1995. So I think many of you know that eelgrass is the main habitat for bay scallops um, and has a lot of important functions. The juvenile bay scallops like to attach to the eelgrass blades. Um, it keeps them off the bottom, keeps them away from predators. It also acts as kind of like a fence. It has a holding mechanism. So when we have scallops close to shore and we have those winter storms with those north winds, um, we need that long eelgrass to keep the scallops from stranding on shore. And I'm sure many of you are around for winters to hear our plea for you know, come help us, we have a scallop stranding, we need, you know, we need to get them back in the water. That is happening more and more frequently. Um, uh, the decline of eelgrass is due to a variety of reasons, um, including but not limited to excessive nutrients, coastal development, and physical disturbances such as sedimentation, boat traffic and speeds, and chain scour that can occur from mooring chains. Back in 2012, the SMP listed eelgrass initiatives from high priority to low priority. Things have changed a lot um, from what we knew then to what we know now. Um, and we can use the eelgrass as an example why an updated management plan is needed um, due to these changing priorities. Some of the high priority items that surrounded the eelgrass um, that are either ongoing or completed um, includes cataloging, mapping, and ground truthing um, our habitat in the harbor, which was completed in 2015 and due for an update as well. Uh, Valerie Hall and Dr. Peter Voice, when they were um, under the umbrella of Mariah Mitchell, they were doing our eelgrass and scallop surveys starting in 2006 all the way up to 2018. And in 2019, our department um, took over uh, resuming these, these um, long-term monitoring surveys um, that are done through diving underwater, and we monitor at least 40 harbor locations every September. Um, high priority items that have not been thoroughly investigated through the shellfish management plan um, or addressed in regards to eelgrass revolve with around practices that involve um, physical damage to the eelgrass. So mooring placement, possible scour, propeller damage, and increased ferry traffic and speeds are all items that were listed as a, a high priority, but they have not really um, been investigated. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about um, the eelgrass restoration that has occurred on Nantucket, and I'm sure Emily can fill in some of the holes. Um, I'm just gonna provide a brief summary. But uh, in the SMP, a medium priority item include, include a development and imp implement a cost-effective strategy to protect and restore eelgrass in locations of significance. Um, and that includes uh, eelgrass receding, propagation, and removing stressors. So lucky for us, the Land Council has been active in, in this area and initiative for many years. Um, and we've been assisting them on occasion, um, providing dive, uh, dive staff and boats to assist with the eelgrass transplant initiatives. Uh, this year, we're thrilled to be in col collaboration with the Land Council and Boston University, working with Noah Singer, who is the Land Council's eelgrass manager. 
Our full staff of certified divers has been assisting uh, with collecting the chutes and providing our dock and our flow through system to um, basically as a hub for staff and volunteers to come and process these chutes and we're gonna hold them until um, they are ready to go out for planting. All right, this is always a scary slide, um, but it talks about the Bay Scout bushel counts um, in the yellow bars. So the first year is probably really tiny. It's tiny on my screen. Um, 1966, and then it goes all the way to 2021. Um, the peak of the Bay Scallop harvest occurred in 1980, um, around 100, I think it was 118,000 bushels. Last year, we harvested around 3,500 bushels. So clearly there's a problem. There's a lot of variability throughout the years. There's, you know, there's some peaks and valleys, um, but as you can see, we haven't been above 20,000 bushels since 1994. Along with that, um, in the, the red line there, that is the num number of licenses that are sold commercially each year. So that number is, has been going down. Last year we sold around 100 commercial licenses, and it makes sense, right, because the, you know, the resource is down as well. Um, but it's a big deal to us because a lot of, 75% um, of the license sales goes towards funding our programs and our research. So when that number goes down, so does, you know, we have to look elsewhere for um, that type of funding. Uh, a bright spot in the Bay Scout fishery occurred last season in Matticut. We did a larval release from the hatchery of around 50 million Bay Scout larvae. They're usually around 12 to 14 days old. Um, and we have different ways that we monitor and track that. Um, but there was a huge recruitment that occurred. Um, you can see on the map there, it's right off of uh, Little Neck and on the other side of the channel. Um, there were about upwards of 50 scallops per square meter in this area. Um, and what that did is it triggered an effort to move out and thin these scallops so that they could grow and we could uh, create some spawning sanctuaries. Um, Samantha Dinette from the Nantucket Shellfish Association co coordinated this large scale effort um, to move seed among the fishermen and is continuing to collaborate with our team and the efforts to monitor this seed to see how it overwintered and to see how it's growing and surviving um, to know whether this is a good strategy moving forward in seed management um, to help uh, you know with the fishery efforts. Um, so what we're seeing is while the conditions for recruitment tend to be variable, um, we have to diversify our stock enhancement techniques moving forward to help the fishery. This year, along with our larval releases, um, we are growing out one million base scallop larvae with each spawn that we do. Um, that's basically what our tanks can hold. Um, but we are putting them in our tanks and then they are going into spat bags into a grow out area into the horse shed. And the first lines were deployed in June and they came out today. And so we're evaluating how many survived. We had 25,000 scallops in each bag. Um, and we're trying to see how many survived and how big they are and if that is in fact a good way uh, to grow some out. Um, there are advantages to stock enhancing with larval shellfish. They um, better survival rates. They can escape predation. Um, you can see them to evaluate. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah, we're looking um, through improving our restoration methods and tracking uh, the effectiveness of each strategy. We're hoping to zone in on a formula that's good for Nantucket um, and our changing island and our changing fishery to create a more sustainable future. Some of the um, adaptations that we are making um, within the hatchery involve diversification of species and projects. So we no longer just do base scallops. We have been doing cohogs for 10 years as well and providing those as stock enhancement for the recreational fishery. We're trying to really choose areas that are accessible 
uh, from shore um, as well as offshore, but we're trying to create an equity on the island so that um, many people can enjoy harvesting shellfish. We are working on improving our survival on hatch rates. If you ever come by the hatchery, we have tours on uh, Monday and Thursday. We're spawning. Um, you can check out what we're doing. But there are lots of different tweaks that we make each year to improve our, our hatch rates. Um, we're finding alternative uses for the systems that we have, like putting the eelgrass shoots in our flow through tanks and maturing the seeds so that they can be planted. Um, and we're trying really hard to improve our educational outreach um, because we have such a growing diverse population here on Nantucket. As far as field base, um, we are, with our larval releases, always fine tuning our rec recruitment locations. Uh, the environment changes a lot, so what worked last year doesn't always work the next year. Um, we are engaging in restoration projects with a shellfish component, especially around coastal resilience. Um, we're working hard to keep the shellfish areas open and accessible. Um, I know we've had some recent closures, um, so that's something that we're working very hard to address. We're also continuing with our long-term monitoring. We're talking about um, the eelgrass and the shellfish surveys. Those are really important because that's what provides a foundation for some of the future projects that Jeff's going to talk about. Um, and also sharing data with other communities. There are other communities that have a base scallop fishery and it's really important that we keep in touch with them and find out what's going on in their world as well. And thank you for having me. And if you have any questions, I'll be here at the end to answer them. Thanks, Tara. Definitely appreciate an update on all of that information and the work you guys have been doing. Um, I don't want to be redundant with what you've already heard. I'll just speed through a couple of additional points, uh, specifically around the, some of the eelgrass work that the Land Council has been involved in. And as Tara said, the Natural Resources Department have, has been instrumental since we started doing this work at supporting um, the entire process. So one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is big picture, long-term eelgrass monitoring, which is something that we have some uh, information on as far as aerial surveys go back from the 90s and maybe before. But as we started to see some of the decline of the extent of those eelgrass beds, we started to explore ways to do some more intensive monitoring of the eelgrass. And there's really a great opportunity for a three-tiered approach. And the aerial surveys are one component, a big picture view of what's happening with our eelgrass. The health assessment work that the Land Council has done with Boston University and Nantucket and Madiket Harbors are kind of a good mid-level tiered approach to monitoring our eelgrass. And then some of the additional work that the town is doing really gives us an even better picture of what's happening around, around our harbors. Another idea that I hope gets discussed in the upcoming months with the harbor plan is whether, in addition to a shellfish management plan, we should be looking at, more specifically, an eelgrass management plan as well to incorporate some of that monitoring and some of the restoration work. The Land Council, with support from the town, has been working on an eelgrass restoration site off of Monomoy Beach now since 2018, and we are about to begin working to restore another half-acre site farther up near Fifth Bend, um, closer to the head of the harbor. The restoration has really been a huge community collaboration. There have been a lot of entities that have been supporting this work. The health assessment and some of the research work has largely been funded by the Nantucket Shellfish Association and the Great Harbor Yacht Club and Land Council Marine Grants Program, uh, in addition to support from the town and the Land Council's Water Fund. As we've proceeded over the last several years, we've been finding about 50 to 60% survival of the plants that have been transplanted so far, which is actually pretty good for the underwater gardening that we're, we're doing out there. And I just wanted to show a few images that were taken about a year ago out at the site along one of the transects. This is an area that had just been planted with some eelgrass shoots and these next images are some areas from the year or two years before and how they have started to coalesce and come together in some areas. So it's nice to actually see what's starting to happen throughout the transplant location. 
As Tara mentioned, what we're working on this summer with Noah Singer, who's here up front, if anyone wants to ask him questions later, is experimenting with some eelgrass seeding techniques that may be another tool in our toolbox for helping to restore some of these areas. And I can tell you from Noah that we would love additional volunteers throughout the rest of the summer and fall to help with this work. So before we get into questions and answers and discussions, I just wanted to say a couple things about where we're at with our Harbor Health and addressing the future. We've been talking quite a bit about the monitoring and the restoration work, which is really important. It's a big component of moving forward. And I wanted to throw in this aerial from Hither Creek and Madiket because we often focus so much on Nantucket Harbor, but we are all also doing quite a bit of work out in Madiket Harbor as well. Evaluating the water quality in an, on an ongoing basis and our habitat health is certainly important. And you've heard a little bit about the 2009 Harbor Plan and some of the recommendations that were there. I talked a little bit about the Massachusetts Estuaries Report for Nantucket Harbor back in 2006, which is what established our target nitrogen levels. And one of the things that all of these previous plans have pointed to is the importance of continuing to really address the sources of pollution. Certainly, while we have heard that the water quality in parts of the harbor has been improving from the perspective of those nitrogen levels, we still see quite a bit of ecosystem decline with the state of the eelgrass, the algal growth, and the um, bay scallop fishery as far as the harvest. So looking to the future, I think it's just so important for the town and the community to continue to move the needle on implementing some of those action items that we need to address the sources of pollution. And some of those inputs like fertilizer, stormwater, and wastewater that you've already heard a little bit about that have been identified now for decades as those sources that we have some power to address is something that I'm really hoping as we move forward in this planning process, we can engage in a much louder way of with discussions on actually how we're gonna continue to address those into the future as well. Um, so I'm gonna have Jeff just mention a few upcoming projects that they have on the horizon and then get ready to run around with the microphone and take some questions and hear some concerns from the audience. All right, so I'll, I'll jump right in. I didn't make any PowerPoint slides because I felt like everyone by this point was probably tired of looking at PowerPoint slides. So I'll be really brief and then we'll get to questions and answers. So a couple years ago, the, the Town of Nantucket Select Board adopted a new strategic plan and some strategic plan goals. And one of the goals that has really challenged our department is their environmental leadership goal. And the big ticket item of that was the water quality management plan that, that we've put together and gotten back to them. But I think the message that we took from that was we need to do more to be leaders. We need to step up what we're doing and the services we're providing and really transition from we're collecting data to we're taking action based upon that data and what that's showing us and still collecting high quality data. So to kick that off, I'm going to talk about some data collection projects, obviously. But uh, the big project that we have coming in this year, and we're, we're getting ready to submit it out for procurement, is a Nantucket Harbor watershed redelineation and groundwater nutrient study. So what that study is going to do is determine the area and redetermine the area that was last determined in 1990 for what's contributing to the harbor, both on the surface and through groundwater. What's getting there? And then more importantly, when we're looking at it, what's making up that groundwater and where? You know, is the groundwater that's coming from Bonamoy, what are the nutrient components that are there? Are they different than what's coming in in Pacamo? Are they different than what's coming in Wawinet? And when we know what those constituents are, what tools can we give those neighborhoods to say, these are the things we need to manage here, and this is how we could do it. How we can be successful neighborhood by neighborhood, because not everywhere is gonna have an option for something like sewering. You know, I'll be perfectly honest and say, sewers are probably never going to well win it or else it's going to be a very, very long time. Um, so what tools can we give them? How can we help them? How can we develop programs for 
IA septic systems to go in and not break the bank for people that are up there? What can we help with for vegetation management and things? But that study is hopefully going to be doing that and then setting a way for us to continually monitor that groundwater going forward so we know those results are coming in and we can see it and we can fine tune as we go. So we're very excited about that study. Another study for, um, for Nantucket and, and a little bit in Maddock and Harbor in our more of our resiliency vein, but it, it's pretty germane to this, is a sediment transport and more importantly that comes with that, a dredge plant. And what that does is it's going to look about not just how water is moving, but how sand is moving around the harbor, where it's depositing, where it's, uh, where it's eroding, how it's moving, and, and how it's that living dynamic that it has. So when we do a dredge project and we know how we're going to prioritize, though, we know where we can get beneficial reuse from that sand and where it can go in so we're not just having to redredge it two years later or move it around, but also where we might be able to nourish beaches or supplement um, our coastal dune areas to provide better protection, but also to really look at, are these areas areas that are going to have um, eelgrass complications or sand complications to know really where we can get the best bang for our buck and do that work efficiently, get permits for those efficiently, and really hopefully start to, to implement a program to help improve not only navigation through the harbor, but also better protect some of our vulnerable coastal areas. Um, with that too, we are starting our, our another year, hopefully, with uh, our researcher from Stony Brook, Stephen Heck, to come out and do our annual Bay Scallop and eelgrass survey within the harbor. And we're hopefully going to be adding in Madigan Harbor to that in the next year or so um, as we move forward. So we're, we're moving all of those things, and then those are projects that are already approved and are about to happen and are going to take place in the harbor plan update, obviously. Um, another thing that we're, we're submitting for the Natural Resources Department is we understand being able to create measurable results. And there are areas that the town, um, to be perfectly honest, hasn't done a good enough job in knowing what the impacts of certain inputs are having and how to better address those. So our department has put together what we're calling kind of our baseline environmental data plan. And we're going to start really for the first time as long as it gets approved. So hopefully uh, a lot of people think it's a good idea as well. Um, we're going to continue doing these eelgrass and scallop surveys on an annual basis in perpetuity. We're going to be doing our regular TMDL compliance and doing the, the water on the ponds and the harbors in perpetuity and going to collect that information. But the two things that we want to add in is then rolling out that same groundwater study that we're doing in Nantucket Harbor for our ponds and for our other harbors and collect that data to give those neighborhoods the opportunity to also improve their inputs. And then the last part that I, I kind of, I'll, I'll bur won't bore everyone with it, is we're also going to the first time going to start monitoring what our storm water inputs are. We want to go out and start collecting data from our outfalls and knowing what those are, collecting data from our storm water collection system and seeing what that input is and where we need to get the most improvement from to stop impacting our harbor with stormwater. Uh, I, I think it's, everyone has seen it. We, I mean, everyone drives through puddles and knows that management of that system is difficult. Uh, the town has been talking for a very long time about putting together some sort of stormwater regulatory program to deal with that. But I think first and foremost with that, we also need to make sure that we could measure the results to make sure that the decisions we make were good decisions, and if the data shows differently, that we can address it quickly and get it fixed and move forward and really take steps there. That's really the part of the controllable load that we haven't really tackled yet. We've tackled wastewater, we tackled fertilizer. Stormwater is really kind of the, the next big um, initiative for us, and it, it, it's something that, frankly, the town needs to be leaders in and step up and do. Uh, there's a lot of private systems as well, but make sure that the town carries the standard and everyone else will hopefully follow. Um, and with that too, the last program that, uh, the first public hearing was at the select board last week and it was continued September. Uh, our department in conjunction with health has put together for the first time what we're calling um, illicit discharge regulations. And those are really focused at the proper management of things like swimming pools and spas. Um, I know, we get lots of calls and complaints about people pumping those into the road, pumping those into the stormwater system, and making sure that those discharges are clean water and those are being managed correctly and we're not putting chlorinated water into our stormwater system, which is ultimately making it to the harbor, making sure that there are safeguards in place and ways to measure that. 
um, and also dealing with things like construction dewatering, dealing with sump pumps, and enabling people to have choices to make that they're not having an impact to do. You know, encouraging people instead of pumping into a stormwater system, maybe using something like a rain garden or a bioswale and having somewhere to infiltrate on your own property in an aesthetically appealing way, but providing that filtration before it gets to the groundwater. So that's where we're kind of headed. I know that's probably a lot of stuff to, to take in. It's a lot of new things that we're hopefully coming forward. But as always, please come see us, talk to us. If you have ideas or thoughts, please come. Please come to our office, the health department meetings, the conservation commission meetings, participate in the harbor plan, participate in coastal resiliency. Um, your ideas are what we need to help improve. So um, with that, I don't know where Emily disappeared to, but I'll stop talking and let, let you guys ask us some questions. Thanks, Jeff. But one second, before Noah takes my microphone, if everyone could, if you could please just pass your comment cards to the middle, um, and I'll ask really nicely for one of our staff to, to go grab those. If you're not done, just come set them on the presenter's table before you leave, and we'll grab those. And we thank you guys for your input on this. I was going to make that announcement, but thanks, Jeff. Uh, OK, so I have some questions myself, but I would love to open this up to the floor now. Uh, Noah also has a microphone over there. So if anyone has a question, a comment, Ron. And I'm going to ask everyone to speak into the microphone because this is being recorded. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, there's, there's been discussion about uh, an on-island water quality testing facility. Is there any progress with that? Sure, I'll try my best to answer. I wish, uh, I wish Roberto Santa Maria were here. He's the more of the point person for the town, so I'll try to do my best. So there, we've done a number of looking into a water quality testing lab and processing lab, and we, we've brought in, I wish I remembered his name, we brought in a specialized consultant, someone who sets up these labs off island and puts those together. And at the time we were doing it and projecting the number of tests and things that we were collecting moving forward, the result of the initial study was that unfortunately at the time, that facility would not be able to economically sustain itself. But that is also something that we always actively look to update and seek to do. I know uh, that's a project we've worked on with Wanakama Water and Mark Willette um, and David Gray at the sewer department. I do think ultimately it may make some sense to put in, but I also think we want to make sure that it also makes sense economically to put in, that it's just not um, costing us more than what it's costing us to do now. We want to make sure that it's available and can sustain itself because I think the last thing we want to do is get committed to it, not be able to sustain it, and then have to, to deal with that situation. So um, again, it's a program that we continually look at. We do get this question quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, right now, the dollars and cents don't make sense. Uh, but hopefully sometime in the near future, they start to, we'll start to get closer in alignment. But I, I'd be happy to share. If anyone's interested in that report, they can contact me and I'd be happy to send that out to folks if people would like to see that directly. I have one over here. So I have a, two questions. Um, one question is what happens that's different about sewage that's collected and taken to the sewage facility to get rid of nitrogen that isn't happening with you know, regular septic systems. The other question is, I have been told that oysters are a really good way to remove toxins from the water. Is that something we've considered here? And that leads me to a thought, how clean are our oysters? I'll, yeah, I'll chime in on that. Those are great questions. As, for, as far as septic systems versus sewer, um, it would be great to have our wastewater treatment facility director here to, to give you the in and outs of the mechanics that go into that. Um, there's a lot more treatment that sewer provides, the wastewater treatment facility, the contaminant testing, um, you name it. What, what that facility's ability to do is far exceeds what a septic system. Uh, I can't really, I don't have the knowledge uh, to explain 
the intricacies of both of those systems. But as for septics, um, it's, you know, you have to get it pumped out. Uh, a lot of times people don't pump as, as regularly as they should. Um, also, it, when you're carrying, we have a very porous sediment. So anything that is leaking or seeping goes right through and can affect our, our water table, which is, relates to our drinking water. And so we really uh, prioritize sewering. But again, like Jeff said, it's not going to be possible in certain areas. But they do have updated, um, innovative, uh, art, sorry, innovative alternative. That's right. I want to always say artificial intelligence, but that's not it. <laughs> uh, septic systems that can run a little pricier, but are a better alternative if you can't connect to sewer. Um, but if you leave your email, that's a, that's a great question that I can pass on to our director of the wastewater treatment facility. As for oysters, yes, we, that's why we have our shell recycling program. We have all of this recycled shell that we end up putting into our water because oysters are chemically attracted to their own uh, shell. And so we have a, a wild oyster population that has been on the decline. And a lot of that also is substrate. They need something to attach to. So by us putting back the shells into the water, um, they have an area to attach and grow and to filter our water. So that is a big uh, reason why we do have the shell recycling program. Um, and I believe the other question, yes, how clean are our oysters? I can always pass that to Tara. Um, I love shellfish. Uh, we are lucky to be 30 miles out to sea, and so we're getting that constant flushing of our water. So if you're going to eat oysters anywhere, it's definitely it's definitely on Nantucket. Um, yeah, we do. We do the DMF, the Division of Marine Fisheries, uh, does uh, closures if there's high bacterial levels in our water um, because that is an issue for human consumption. So we also have the state that's monitoring water quality as well. And you can jump in, Tara, if there's something I missed. Yeah, I think as far as the state goes, they're, I would say, overprotective. Um, and so I believe that our seafood and our waters are very, very safe. Um, oysters are great for nutrient reduction. So that's a good thing that they filter that and process that. As far as toxins go and eating, I mean, toxin accumula accumulation happens over time. These oysters are in the water for a short period of time um, for, for harvest, and um, that's not something that I would be concerned about. I would be more concerned about if we got like a red tide that came in and they filtered that um, toxic, uh, harmful algae through their body, and then you were able to you you ate them. That could cause a problem. Um, we do have a harmful algae bloom that we get on occasion. Um, the rust tide and the oyster that does accumulate in the oysters um, but it's not toxic for humans it is detrimental to the shellfish doesn't necessarily kill the adults but um, it's just not a nutritious algae that um, they ingest and so it just causes a decrease in their growth causes oxygen problems in the water and that sort of thing Uh, hello. I just want to make a short comment. Uh, a few new faces, a new plan. I've been hearing new plans for 35 years. Uh, the result is that the harbor is in the worst condition it's ever been in the 52 years I've been observing it. And as uh, Selectman Fee says, the harbor is toast. Enough of negative. I want to give you my wish list. Only three things. Number one, the remaining... 500 residences in the harbor watershed should be sewer. Number two, oil absorbing pillows should be periodically put in all the storm drains and they should be cleaned periodically. And number three, the recreational vessels should be monitored in a realistic manner as well as the boat basin. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Those are some great points, and I'm sure these guys are, are writing them down. I know that the um, 
Harbor Master and her team are handing out die tabs this year uh, to vessels. But yeah, I definitely agree with you. I, I think I would follow Steve's uh, remarks with a question of my own that I would love for the Natural Resources Department folks to address. And it's something that has come up in discussion in the community this past year. And it's really relative to the improvement that we see in some parts of the harbor as far as nitrogen levels and the ongoing decline of the ecosystem health relative to eelgrass and the scallop fishery. And I was wondering if you guys could address that a little bit for the community as far as how um, to reconcile those two differences and what we're seeing out there. Sure, so there's uh, the ongoing monitoring of nitrogen levels in the harbor water are improving in, in some areas. We've been seeing that in the town's um, monitoring reports the last few years. And yet we're seeing a greater increase in the macroalgae, the lingbia. We're seeing eelgrass continuing to decline pretty dramatically and the shellfish population, at least as far as the harvestable numbers, dropping significantly. So we see some data that shows improved water quality and we also see for ourselves out in the harbor that ecosystem decline. And I just would love to start that conversation as far as addressing uh, and trying to reconcile those differences. I, I think that's the big ticket question here is, is, is what is actually going on with our water quality. And I think as anyone who's an ecologist, we understand there's a lot of different parameters that are affecting water quality. It's not just one thing. So although we monitor nitrogen and other water quality parameters, but we have a set goal um, because that is the main nutrient that causes impairment, even though we see a decline over the past 10 years, there's obviously something else going on. And so that's why we're continuing to do research. I, I, I do feel for the gentleman who just spoke about keep on hearing plans and plans, but unfortunately, it's we need data to kind of understand what's going on and then we can weed out certain parameters. So we do focus on nitrogen. We're seeing a downward uh, trend and decline, which is a good thing, but like Emily said, we're still seeing algal blooms, we're seeing a loss of eelgrass. And the only thing I can probably uh, attest to that too is a combination of items. So again, you know, mooring scour, um, high speeds in the harbor that is uh, harming our eelgrass. There is also, you know, we talk about fertilizer going to the harbor, but we also have pesticides um, that we use to kill pests and or plants on our land that's also going into our harbor. And so we haven't looked at pesticide numbers uh, that could have an impact on eelgrass, which there have been studies that have shown that pesticides have caused a decrease in eelgrass. And so there's a lot of confounding factors, which is unfortunate. I wish I had a, a, a clear-cut answer of like what is going on. Obviously, our water quality is not 100%, even though we're, we're looking at that nitrogen level there that is going down. Um, so I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in for that, but that's a, a very good point and big question. Yeah, I have something to add. I would probably say, you know, although we're making these improvements and you get some positive results, um, there's a delayed effect with what you're going to see in the harbor versus what a number is going to tell you with mm -hmm. water quality. And so it's going to take some time once we make these improvements or the improvements that we've already made to, to show that. Uh, one of the things that, you know, I think is a problem with the eelgrass is just the general turbidity in the water. I mean, it's, you know, July and August, we're right on Brant Point with that hatchery and I see the ferries going by, you know, hour after hour, people aren't stopping um, in the no-wake zone. They're just creating, you know, a wake, turbidity, and that all shades out the eelgrass. The sunlight can't get to it, and so we're seeing a, a you know, regression of the eelgrass bed lines along the channel and stuff that were once, you know, right up to the channel in the horse shed and um, Holbert Avenue and stuff like that. So I think in general, there's just a lot of traffic and commotion, not only on the island, but in the water too. As well as coastal development too, which is. Yeah, you know. I, 
I, I really agree with these two, and I, I think the answer to the question is there, there's no silver bullet, right? You, you don't hit the number and magically eelgrass doesn't just return and everything is great. Is We've spent a lot of time impacting the harbor, and, and not knowingly. I mean, it's, it's perfectly normal. You know, they have similar problems with land use in, in Iowa and, and around their rivers and doing things that, that we have here. Is It's why it's so important to have these conversations and take these first steps and to do things where we've identified what we can do and why it's so important to say, what can I do to make my footprint smaller? And if everyone starts to do that, then you start to chip away and you can chip away at the other things that maybe aren't water quality related. They're, they're use related or they're some other benefit because there's a lot of things in the world that we can't control, right? It's, we can't control how much nitrogen's coming from the atmosphere on Nantucket, right? It's a, a global issue. We can't control what the water temperature of the ocean is doing globally, right? Like Nantucket just can't deal with that. Is the, the world is changing, right? The world is changing around us and that is perfectly, it's gonna change over time regardless of what, what our impacts are and, and our impacts can accelerate and decelerate those things. But taking the steps that we can do is what's important in taking those steps. And knowing what's acceptable in the way that we're changing the way that we're living and working together towards that, to me, is what's important, that everyone's doing those things together. That'll be my kumbaya for the moment for the day. Thanks, Jeff, and Tara and Thais for addressing that. I guess I will also just follow up by posing another thought or question that doesn't have to be answered now, but maybe more food for thought as we move forward. But it occurs to me, also based on what you just expressed, Jeff, that since 2006, when our nitrogen targets, our total maximum daily loads for nitrogen were established, we have a lot more information. There's a lot that has changed. We have warming water. We have more activity, maybe more turbulence. And I wonder if it would be appropriate at some point to reassess whether that target number is still the right number for us or if we should really consider trying to change that. And in the meantime, certainly, again, really focusing on how to address those sources and do everything that we can as a community. Um, so I am right now the only thing standing between you and those drink tickets that we handed out when you came in. So I'm going to um, wrap this up, but I just wanted to make one more comment to the, the land council, for those of you who don't know our, our history, we really got started in the 70s as a land protection, open space protection organization. And over the last decade or so, we focused so much more on the water and the health of our water resources. <laughs>